first time using a mic here, so. All right, well, welcome. Like you said, my name is Michael Baltic. Um, I'm a developer, I've been doing this for a little bit over 10 years now, uh, based in the Columbus area the entire time. Um, I'm here to talk to you about current trends in mobile development. Um, we normally give this talk to sales types, manager types, um, to help them make decisions on where should I spend my money in getting my app out into the real world. So uh, I like to say that it's a little bit different when we're talking to an actual tech crowd because when we go out to a sales crowd or, or a manager crowd, we're going to try and just say that we know a little bit about everything because we want the work and then we'll tailor the work afterwards um, to, to meet that. Um, but when it comes down to the real, the real nitty gritty, uh, the talk that I'm gonna give is, is a little bit different. Um, this is what are, where is the market going or where is the developer community going really and how can a manager take that information and tailor it towards creating apps in their own enterprise or for yourself as well, um, creating apps that you can get into the market. <clears throat> so the objectives of this, we're gonna discuss um, some different platform options and the trends for those as well. Um, and then I'm gonna talk to you about how you're gonna match those organizational goals that you have within your company or for yourself with the different platform capabilities. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk about some of the things that we've done here for uh, different apps that I've worked on in the past and that some of my coworkers has worked on as well, and then what I'm currently working on. Um, and then just you know go from there and see what, what you guys are interested in hearing about. So first, let's talk uh, platform options. Um, so you've seen countless talks about all of these. Um, you've got native, where you're actually gonna write code for each specific platform. You're gonna write a, a completely brand new app for iOS, completely brand new app for Android, tablets, um, and then Windows. Um, this could also include uh, Blackberry, Symbian, or any of the countless platforms that are out there, but typically you're going to be required to have that hardware. You're gonna be required to have knowledge in the language that those apps are written in. Um, and you're gonna need a lot of different devices for those as well so that each specific one that you're gonna test on. The middle one I have listed there, um, HTML5. In the past year or so, everybody's been talking about JavaScript, 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 all the different JavaScript frameworks out there. Um, HTML5, they're gonna solve all your problems. Um, we can write code once and then deliver a mobile website um, that you can run on an Android, you can run on an Android tablet, you can run on an iPhone, you can run it in landscape, you can run it on a, uh, a Google Glasses is, is what I, I've seen most recently. Um, all just using HTML and JavaScript. Um, typically, you're not as constrained by hardware choices, uh, but you are constrained in the fact that it is ever-changing. So by the time you start the project, the library that you use to create the UI has gone through seven iterations, and you're now on, you know, you're seven years behind uh, the trend, and um, all of the bugs that you're encountering are fixed by the release that just came out last week, but now it's gonna cost me $20,000 to retest all of my app after I deploy it. <clears throat> um, the third one is cross-compiled. Um, there are a lot of options for this. Um, you can write code once and then try to reuse it. So there are a couple different frameworks out there. Um, Accelerator is one that you write JavaScript and then it converts it into a, uh, uh, a native type code. And then the, the latest one, and the one that I'm probably gonna try and convince you that is the, the best way to go in the current trend is Xamarin, um, that actually compiles code that you write once down into native code for each of the platforms. So I, I have a knowledge base of C Sharp and I write code that converts into iOS directly, has near native performance, um, and I can then reuse that code on Android, Windows Phone, BlackBerry, all of those things. Um, now when you come down to this, you're gonna have kind of the same um, issues that you had with, uh, 
writing pure native, you're going to need all the devices again um, to test them because obviously you're going to have very platform specific issues with all of them as well. But what you do get to save is now I only have to test up to 80% of that. You know, some, some of these platforms give you 60 to 80% code reuse. Um, so we're going to reduce costs, we're going to speed up development and make it easier to get into the various markets and start making money. Because that's what everybody really wants to do. They either want to make money or save money. So that's what these uh, different options are, are going to give you. Um, so which one should you choose? Like I said before, um, I'm going to try and talk you into choosing one of the, the various paths. But typically, this is the kind of thing that you're going to have to worry about. So, somebody came up with this slide, um, brace yourselves for the coming religious debate. So even within our company, there are people who are very uh, excited about a different technology and think that it's the end-all be-all answer to everything. Um, there are no silver bullets, so um, unless you're in uh, the movie Twilight, you're not going to have any... Um, one magic thing that's going to get you to the end. Um, what's the, the right choice for you might be completely wrong for the other person because they've got a completely different app. They've got a completely different target audience that they're trying to, trying to get uh, their message out to. So in the end, it, it's, it's all going to um, wash out. But my um, argument is uh, why not do them all? <laughs> Um, so everybody talks about, uh, I need this specific platform because I want to target mobile apps, I want to target native functionality. And then the next person talks about, well, I really just need to get the message out, so I need to target the least common denominator, I need to get on the web um, and get all of our functionality out. Let's do it all. So the, uh, the market is, is is glutted full of all of these apps. Um, how many different calendar apps do you need? How many different weather apps do you need? How many different messaging platforms are there that don't talk to each other? Everybody's a me, 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 me. I have this what app. I have this. I've done this. Um, so really, when it comes down to it, the market, the argument that the app store is going to get you anything specific is not very uh, compelling because unless you have a budget of ten million dollars your app is going to be lost in the sea of sameness um, and you say well I need that cool factor too but everybody else has got that cool factor so really the, the message comes down to is the platform and the, these decisions don't really matter. It's, it's let's get it out there. Let's spend the time and effort to make sure that it works and people like it. And, and the rest will come, come, for, uh, come after that. The, the last part about this is the budget market is, um, is kind of exploding right now. So Apple tends, trends toward the high end. And then Windows Phone with the Lumias, they've been targeting some of the smaller markets and as well as Android. Um, there are going to be uh, predicted to be 750 million mobile devices that are in the budget market within the next three years. So as you see from all of these 50 billion, 50 billion apps, there are stories out there of somebody who made a million dollars in a week. Um, Flappy Bird just happened two weeks ago. Um, Flappy Bird's already gone, but he made his $2 million, so it was a success, right? He may get sued later and lose all of his money, but um, that's not really our concern. Uh, but one of the biggest markets, and uh, a story that just came out last week was Windows Phone um, sells a lot of um, budget devices and apps that target budget devices, if you can get a dollar from each of those person or if you can get one ad impression from 10% of that install base, you're going to make money. So um, it comes down to let's, let's figure out what's most important to your app um, and not talk about the environment that you're, that you're specifically targeting. So. Um, the right choice is not always the best question to ask. It's what user experience do you want to present? 
um, a good user experience will sell your app more than it being on the iPhone. Um, a user experience will sell your app more than it being it's cheap versus it's $10. Um, a good user experience will make sure that people keep your app and talk about your app and, sh and keep using your app a year from now. Um, the performance of your app is also pretty important because uh, if you start writing bad code and but I'm on the iOS store, then it's going to be poor, poor performance and you're going to get bad reviews and then nobody's going to talk about your app and then the next thing that comes along that iterates what you did but it runs a little bit better is going to be the next thing and they're going to make all the money and you're going to go by the wayside. Um, supportability goes along with that as well. So if you write bad code um, that you don't know anything about, uh, you are not going to be able to go back and fix those bugs because you're not going to know what's going wrong or why you're not able to fix those bugs. Um, and that all goes along with adoption as well. So um, if, like I said, you write bad code, it goes out into the store just because you're in the iOS store, just because you're on the Android um, Google Play store, doesn't mean that you're going to be a success if you've got buggy, crappy code that, that nobody wants to use and share with their friends. Now on the lower half of this, I consider these are kind of in-house concerns um, when it comes to development. Uh, the developer tools that you use. Um, how many people here have quit a job because I don't want to use Visual Studio? How many people have quit a job because I don't want to use Eclipse? I don't want to use Oracle? Um, those things come down to, to being pretty important. Um, testing, debugging, CI, continuous integration. Um, what kind of things uh, make it easier to get my app into the store and also maintain it? Um, because in the end, if I have to pay a lot of money to do all of these things, that's going to eat into the profits that I make whenever I, I deliver that app. Um, packaging is also another concern. So if I build this great thing, but I have no way to get it to the market, then what do you do with it? Nothing. I've got this great code, but it doesn't do anything in it because I can't get it into the app store. Um, and whenever I do get into the app store, the, the package that I delivered it with is so hard to maintain that I, I can't do anything with it and I end up wasting a lot of money that way as well. Um, and then the last bullet, again, developer preferences. So JavaScript was huge last year. Everybody wanted to work on JavaScript. Um, if you were still doing uh, C Sharp or, or Java code, you were not cool and your friends didn't want to talk to you anymore and you would sit, at, sit by yourself at Chipotle um, <laughs> while everybody else had their burritos. Um, and, and now we're actually seeing, it didn't last very long, so JavaScript um, kind of peaked in the fall a little bit, I would say, and then now we're kind of trending back towards native a little bit more. So you'll see a lot more uh, C Sharp, Java, and uh, Objective C talk, I think, in the in the spring and the summer. <clears throat> All right. So first, let's talk about user experience. Um, the user expectations drive uh, a big part of your decisions. So if you're making a photography app, um, the people that are going to buy your app are going to want to have a great user experience. They're going to expect certain things to be available on the screen. They're going to expect a certain uh, amount of fluidity to the design as well, um, and it to kind of mimic the natural functions of, of photography. If you're doing a financials app, they're going to expect quick performance and math operations and a clean presentation of their data. Um, and when you present those things on an iPhone versus an Android versus a Windows phone, people have different expectations as well. As well. They want the same um, amount of data, but presented to them in a way that is intuitive for the platform that they're on. Um, and when you start talking about these uh, catch-all um, solutions, uh, it tends to take away from your app as opposed to enhancing it. Um, the cost of custom development can also drive the, the user experience as well. So if I don't know anything about Objective-C, then I'm going to spend a lot of money getting up to speed on Objective-C and learning how to write good code. Um, and then if I have to turn around and then migrate this app to Android, we're going to have the same issue. Um, 
So I spend a lot of time talking about uh, getting the most value out of development and speed to market. Um, and the custom development portion of it, where if, if, that, if you can save the most money there, that's where you're going to see the most profitability in your app. Um, so to go along with that, performance. So if I have plus five database rights to my app, then I'm going to get, you know, uh, a higher score whenever I deliver this app to the uh, to the different app stores. Uh, if you know, if I have uh, plus five database rights and plus five um, network reads and plus three UI enhancements, then uh, we'll get an epic level app that will make us lots of money. Um, but uh, when, when we start talking about the different concerns and the, the ways of developing these apps. The hardware acceleration, the scrolling, the animation, the trans transitions, the actual code implementation is going to be one of the things that's going to make or break your app. So if I don't know how to write performance app code in one of these specific environments for Java or Windows Phone, um, Objective-C, um, we're going to have poor performance. Um, therefore, our app is going to be sent to the bottom of the, b the bargain bin, um, whereas if we have great performance, um, and, a, and a compelling UI, then we're going to go back to the, uh, to the top of the sales list. Um, tied into that, supportability. Jack of all trades, uh, that's not going to get you much with your um, specific environments um, that you're trying to target on each of these different platforms. Oops, sorry. On each of these different platforms. Um, do we, do we maintain one code base? Do we have one guy who's writing all of this code and he doesn't know the very specific ins and outs of iOS development versus Android development versus Windows Phone development? Um, but he's, he's able to main, you know, do a little bit of everything. So if we can use him for, uh, or her um, for a majority of the work and then have someone come in and, and do tailored um, specific work, we can uh, cut the budget down on um, the cost to get our apps in, uh, into all of these stores. And then we can also um, increase our profitability by uh, implementing new features whenever it comes time to um, to develop those. We can hire a, you know someone to come in and add these very specific functions that, that target just those uh, few unique platform features. Um, and then adoption and retention, I talked about this earlier. Uh, some people are always going to say, hey, it's on iOS. Um, that's why it's great. That's why I love it. This is the best app ever. Well, I have this on Android too. Yeah, but it doesn't look the same as it does on my iPhone, so I don't really like it. Um, or it, it looks so much better on my large Windows phone screen, so it, it's so much cooler than your app. But in the, in the end, um, those kind of things will take you a majority of the way, but to keep you going and to keep this cycle rolling um, for uh, a long time, you're going to have to uh, be able to retain um, those people with a, a compelling u uh, user experience and um, performance, supportability, all of those things that we talked about so far. Um, now the last. Uh, well, one of the last things here, um, developer tools, like I said, um, there, there are a lot of people out there who are very adamant about the tools that they use to create their code and create their apps as well. Um, there's religious debates within our own organization and everywhere I've ever been. So some people love Visual Studio, some people love Eclipse, some people have very strong opinions of either. Um, and there's also different maintenance costs as associated with those as well. So. If you want to talk about uh, keeping what's cool and um, what's easy to use, uh, this comes down to, to saving you money in the end because every time someone leaves because of one of these things, that's going to that's gonna be very hard to absorb into your um, production cycle. Um, the last thing is uh, packaging. So to app or not to app. So this is an uh, 
an example of something that is overdone to the extreme. So I wrote JavaScript and HTML to create um, a news list for you to consume all of my information. And then I wrapped it up in cellophane and a tray, and then I put each individual little one on a, on a pallet and then shipped those off in a car for each one at, at way overkill. So if I've already created all this HTML and JavaScript, I've already created all this reusable code, why not deliver it in a way that's easy for everyone to consume? So do this. Um, take what you've already created, put it out there as easily as possible. So if that turns out that I wrote Objective-C once, um, put it out on the iPhone and then convert it to something else. But don't try and shoehorn everything into one and then expect it to be um, cost efficient to do this as well. Um, the framework support is not there for uh, converting all of these apps natively. So what kind of tools can we use that uh, will help us? And, and I have a couple different slides here that I, the lead up to this was um, the trends that are that are going on. So I mentioned one of these in the, in the compiled um, apps section and Xamarin. So Xamarin's the one that, that everybody's kind of talking about right now. Um, I've spent eight, eight and a half years uh, writing C Sharp code. Um, but before that I did C++, I did C, um, I've written Java, uh, XML, all of these things. And when I talk about saving costs, um, Xamarin is the one that uh, is trending right now to reuse 80% of our code. So it, it ships with a uh, very small binary of the .NET runtime um, with your code that if you write this app in C Sharp, um, I can deliver this to the iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Blackberry stores um, with very little customization. And as long as I spend that 20% of the time creating a very compelling user experience and very performant UI, I'm going to achieve success and, and create some things that are, that are actually quite uh, compelling. Um, it has near native performance. Like I said, it comes with a very small UI uh, library that runs alongside of your app um, so that we can statically link to all of the, the iOS libraries. So I have a slide. Yeah. Uh, most of the stuff comes into play when you talk about creating the actual UI layer of your code, but the rest of that is all stuff that everybody can write. So I can write the service codes, I can write the code that, that, that iterates through a list, and then I can spend that 20% of my budget um, on the high resource, high value resources. Um, that will get me to the top of the market. So if I use something like this, then I can take all of that existing code that I spent creating all of those lists and how to read in, how to submit transactions, how to submit payments, reuse that on the next platform, and all I have to do is rewrite the UI piece. And then I can deliver the exact same code to Android that I wrote for my iOS app um, and just spend a little bit of time um, making sure that the things that we talked about, the uh, expectations of an Android application versus an iOS application are met. And then uh, developer tools. So I use Visual Studio for a very long time. Um, Xamarin is built right into Visual Studio and I can use it to create all of these apps. So I can write C Sharp code that as long as I have a Mac to compile it down to, um, I can create uh, Mac, Mac apps that uh, I can deliver to the store right on the same OS that, uh, and IDE that I've used for years and years and years. Um, you can also then take that same C Sharp code that you've written and via Visual Studio, it's already built in to create your website, now publish the exact same code that you just wrote with an HTML5 front end and use that to target those users that aren't going to actually download an app from your, from your phone, for their phone. Um, so that's, that's the main trend that's, that's coming up right now um, in my eyes. 
that's where I see most of the talk coming from. There are a couple different ones that that are also uh, kind of popular right now. So Telerik has their talks all tailored around um, the, the native versus web approach as well. Um, what they have created are various sets of UI tools um, leveraged on top of each of those platforms. So they don't have an integrated IDE, but they have um, UI controls that can target all of those as well. And uh, it just saves you time on, re on recreating functionality that you're already um, implementing in one place. They have it so the same exact tool set that you create across these three different things. You still have to take the time to create those. But uh, it, it just saves time on um, finding the nuances of each one. Um, it does create a little bit of a vendor lock-in, though. So if you decide you want to upgrade your app to something different, um, you're going to have to learn all new controls. Uh, so the teller, they're, they're trying to solve a problem um, without actually doing the, the really hard way of compiling down to pure native development. Um, so in my mind, this will help you get part of the way there, but if you really want to like take it to that really performant, top-tier apps in the store, um, the Xamarin is probably going to help you the most. And then the last one, there's a couple different one of these, so I'm just going to highlight one that we're currently using. Um, this is Zurb Foundation. Um, it's, it's an HTML5 uh, responsive framework, um, so you can write it once. It'll look the exact same in any web browser. Um, and it'll look, it'll look the same no matter what size screen they're on. And it's really uh, robust and is well documented, so um, it'll help you speed up getting your app to market. And then you can use any of those wrapper apps that we talked about earlier uh, to package it and deliver it to the store. Now this is going to still leave you in the JavaScript way, so this is kind of what I saw is like the trend leading up to where we are now and where it's kind of switching. So like I said, we're currently using this on one of our projects um, and I would highly recommend using it again, but uh, to go to that next level, to take our app to that next level that has that true native feel, um, we're going we're gonna to go with something either pure native or, or try Xamarin out. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and, and I have more, I have case studies on, on a lot of different uh, tools as well that I can talk with anybody afterwards if you want to. If you have questions about some of the, I've researched most of them. Um, Sentia Touch, uh, and then PhoneGap, um, Titanium, all of these different things. So if you have any questions about that, you can, you can ping me afterwards. Um, so now I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about kind of the, the real world decisions that we've made on, on a few recent apps that Cardinal has worked on in the past year or so. <clears throat> um, and we've got a, a much larger mobile practice in Cincinnati where a couple of these stories are kind of come from. But we've done a couple very high profile apps here locally as well uh, that I'll touch on at the end. Um, so the first one is a, uh, a field sales support app for Ethicon. Um, they're based in Cincinnati. Um, and uh, this is used for their sales team. It allows reps to just look up product and contract data and display marketing materials to their uh, customers. Um, it's only on the iOS right now, so it's both iPhone and iPad. Um, and and why, did we, why did we choose to go native over a web for this? Well, as you can see from these charts that are there, um, they're all generated kind of on the fly and we can come up with different stuff um, for them. And those kind of things on the web are a nightmare. So uh, we wanted performance and uh, the ability to do these intense graphics. Um, there's also a lot of videos that are associated with this. so. They might not always be in a sales or an area where the uh, salesperson can get access to Wi-Fi or 4G data. Um, so the ability to play offline media was huge for them, and that's why we uh, went with that. Um, so what kind of lessons did we learn from this? Uh, the iPad and the iPhone are different beasts. Um, 
the different form factors require a lot of testing. Uh, there's all kinds of issues with syncing offline data that are they're not really unique to any platform, but um, just learning the new way of doing an Objective C was a little bit of a uh, little bit of a trial, um, and then kind of boring things that most people don't really want to care about until you get down to the nitty gritty and you decide you have to deal with it. Uh, issues with doing network protocols and, and stuff like that. Um, but this was integrated with uh, Amazon services. Um, so there are a lot of existing apps out there that you can uh, Google and find things on um, questions on how to implement this or how to implement that. But uh, the notifications also kind of, kind of were a little bit of a headache. Uh, push notifications aren't always reliable, and I'm actually running to this, this problem right now on a different, different app, different platform, but um, push notifications aren't always reliable, and when Apple service goes down, then, or Amazon goes down, then you're, you're screwed. So the offline, the offline capabilities of this to be able to store data and uh, videos was huge. Um, all right, so CentOS was another uh, app that we did for field sales automation. Now this one is actually a packaged app. It's um, HTML5 and JavaScript um, using the uh, Cincha Touch platform. Um, why, first of all, why did we go that route? Uh, this one was used by people in the field, so they had whatever device they had. So if this manager gave their employee iPhone 4s and this manager over here gave them Galaxies, they could use whatever they want. Um, and then they just had to go and download the uh, the installer, and then it would run kind of native, but not kind of truly native. Um, and it looks the exact same on all of these platforms. So if you can see on the, uh, I can't see it. I can't. I don't know how to zoom on that. But um, you can see they're kind of a little bit of the same. They have the same app bar at the bottom, whereas normally in a Android app it would be at the top versus being at the bottom just like the iPhone app. So that one's styled a little bit uh, different. So what kind of uh, lessons did we learn about this one? So as with the last like three apps that I've worked on that used HTML5 and wrappers, um, debugging is really, really hard. Um, so if you have issues with a specific device, you end up having to come up with all these workarounds to figure out uh, debugging. If you want to write an HTML5 app and all you've got are Windows machines, um, debugging it on an iPhone is impossible, pretty much. Uh, so, yeah, having a Mac is, is, in, is paramount sometimes when it comes down to these things. Um, also, these, these, all of these container apps like Cincha Touch and PhoneGap Build and PhoneGap, um, they don't like it when their page gets really big, so the, they use a browser view that if the app starts using a bunch of memory, then you don't have really control over that as much as you would with native development. Um, and it can end up crashing your app for just unknown reasons. Uh, also, browser inconsistencies. Uh, Android being as fragmented as it is, um, the, the, the differences between Android 2.2, 2.3, 3.0, 4.3 are huge and create all kinds of problems that you, you just, it costs so much money to, uh, to deal with that uh, it, it becomes the worst thing you've ever dealt with. <laughs> the worst thing. I mean, Android 2.2 was, 2.2.3 was like the worst ever. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, and then we don't really save much in doing this because since we're delivering this app to the two different stores, we've got multiple deployments as well. And then now we've always all, all <clears throat> now we've also got to deploy this to the web. Um, so unless you've got a really good public facing infrastructure in place to deploy these kinds of things and maintain those, those uh, practices, then it, it can get really difficult. Um, the next one was Vantive Accept. So this is a, a direct competitor to services like Square 
um, or uh, I'm trying to think of another competitor to Square right now. But um, so it has to be very, very performant. It also has to have hardware level encryption. Um, and the UI is very important on this one as well. So because this one is prettier than the next one can make or break the app in the App Store. Um, so these are two truly native apps. One is for uh, iPhone and one is for Android. Um, and as you can see, this is like pretty much what you see everywhere you go now. Um, but what, uh, what kind of lessons did we learn from this one? Um, the uh, differences of hardware level uh, capabilities is huge. So Apple only has one or two devices, so it's very easy to target um, certain hardware level features. And the newer iPhones all have hardware encryption built into them. Um, so it's easy to target a very large uh, section of the market. Um, the Android, again, the fragmentation leads you to uh, inconsistencies with the keypad, inconsistencies with the touch screen, inconsistencies with um, hardware en encryption, and, and all of those things can, can make, make or break it. Uh, now there's continuous integration for both of these, so since the, the back-end services are all the same, that's, that's the best part about this one, but the, uh, the customization all came from the UI, and that's where all the headache came from as well. <clears throat> um, and then the other big lesson learned w from this one was the transition from phone to tablet um, dealing with these kind of things. You have to have a really good user experience person to design these for you to make sure that the, the kind of things that you're doing whenever you're on a tiny screen translate to the big screen as well. Um, and also that you're not missing something out with, when you're looking at this big um, screen if you've got a very large blank space for the signature but there's very something very important over here that you're missing you might see that whenever you're on a tiny device versus the the larger device um, and then the last thing on the issues learned was kind of uh, again memory issues on all the different devices so the Apple one again you've only got one or two that you're targeting whereas on the Android one all of them have different amount of RAM they all have a different uh, hardware um, CPU uh, and graphics capabilities. So it, it just came down to which ones we're going to actually support and which ones are actually popular. <clears throat> um, this next one, Kroger Store, uh, this one was um, surprisingly popular. Uh, and this lets you do digital coupons and shopping lists that you can maintain on your app, on your uh, device. So when you go to the store, you might not have internet connection because you might be Wi-Fi only. So that's why this one was pure native. Um, also, there's a lot of uh, graphics involved in this one. And if you're pulling down deals all the time for, um, for all of these various coupons and maintaining all these lists, Doing that over the web all the time is, is going to be problematic. So it just made more sense to uh, create a, a native app. Um, being able to do this without the internet, of course, was huge. Um, also, you're able to use this to find deals that are close to you. So it uses the GPS that's built into your devices. Um, and then it also has a QR code, UPC bar code scanner. So you can actually scan something, look it up to see if it has a coupon. Um, so if you have your phone with you in the store. Um, some of the lessons that were learned from this one, uh, going back to that Android fragmentation thing, so maintaining backwards compatibility with all the stuff. You write all these new features for uh, Android 4.3, and then it doesn't work whenever you go to load it in 2.2.3.4. Um, and and that's, that's always tough, and you're always going to run into that. Uh, how can you get around that? It, having a good testing framework in place, having a good continuous integration framework in place. Um, and then some of the other challenges were, uh, again, the, the different screen sizes, the different resolutions um, on all of the different Android devices make graphics and uh, 
light, uh, like touch areas, difficult to factor for all of the uh, all of the different scenarios. So you end up spending a lot of time testing. You end up spending a lot of time tweaking your uh, UI and your design a lot. Um, And there are actually a couple different, I was just talking with someone this, about this right before the thing. There's a, there's a lab here locally for uh, maintaining a large, if you don't have access to one of every device, there's, uh, there are a couple labs and there's one here locally um, that has access to various different tablets and phones. And then we're actually trying to set one up here at Cardinal as well. So you can come in and test your app on X, Y, and Z device to make sure that it's still working. <coughs> Uh, how are we doing on time? 642. Okay. Um, one more. Okay, so One Carolinas, uh, these are both native apps as well. Um, and this one was just updated, and this is for the Carolinas healthcare system um, in North Carolina. And uh, they did a, a native app themselves first, and a uh, huge flop. Nobody wanted to use it. Um, and so then they called in our usability experts and uh, had them bring in some expertise. Um, and then redesigned it and then came up with this and now uh, they have a, a much higher user base. Um, and we had already done some of their other work for them as well. Uh, and so they went with the same, uh, same team before since we had that uh, domain knowledge as well and we delivered something that was very compelling and is, and is used. So if you're, there's this uh, feature for you to find the local service wait time, so if I break my arm and I don't want to wait three hours to go and have it fixed, I see that there's one that's you know just a couple miles further away um, with a much shorter wait time. That's the biggest feature, which I don't know that I would be uh, using my phone um, whenever you know I'm in a life-threatening situation, but for all of the times this time, I've been, uh, had a lot of colds this year, so I've sat at uh, urgent care a couple different times, and if I had known that there was an hour shorter wait at the one five miles away, I would have gone to it quite a bit. So this one is, is one of our more popular successes, um, but some of the lessons learned from this one, um, a lot of the Android devices were too old to support all of this content, so uh, that's why we went and HTML and JavaScript uh, it was easy to get up and running. Um, so since it was a government agency, it was low cost, low cost, low cost. Uh, so what's the one thing to get this content out as fast as possible? Um, so we used jQuery and we had our usability person come in and then we did a lot of testing with uh, uh, disabilities as well because these are going to be obviously be used by veterans and a lot of them are going to have sight issues or touch issues or, or mobility issues so um, we did a lot of uh, studies on that as well and designed this out so they can just go out there and look up benefits that are available to them um, and then there's uh, some native functionality built into PhoneGap that w this is wrapped around with jQuery to in the browser grab their GPS position and show them all of their uh, service providers that are close by to them so that they can go out and find whoever can provide them the most valuable information. Um, also, being that it was uh, veterans, not all of them are going to have iPhones. Um, some of them might have simple WAP browsers on their phone. Um, and we can get to a majority of this content, not all of it, it won't look the same, but uh, most of the content will render out no matter what since it's just JSON and HTML. Um, the lessons learned on this one, uh, again, since this is where all of my hate for Android 223 came in, um, it had so many issues. And then all of a sudden, right at the end, somebody was like, well, now we got to support 22. And I was like, that's even older. Uh, and it has much less functionality. Um, all right, so in summary, uh, you've got various different options with plus pros and cons for each one of them. Um, native, uh, you've got the great performance, you've got great user experience. Um, you're going to have a high learning curve for all of those. Uh, you're going to have to target each of those platforms directly, so that's bad. 
Um, and then in the HTML and JavaScript worlds, everybody knows how to do HTML and JavaScript, so you're going to save money right there because it's going to be easy to get there. Um, some of the, the negatives are the browser inconsistencies and then also just the lack of feature functionality that you're not going to be able to, to target. Um, and then the cross-compiled kind of solves a little bit of both of those. Um, like I said, Xamarin is up and coming. It's the one that's, that everybody's talking about right now. Uh, you can still deliver a great user experience um, with a lot of code reuse. Um, now, kind of some of the negatives are going to be that unless you know C sharp, there's going to be that, but that learning curve. But if you do know C sharp, that learning curve goes away, and then you just need to hire someone to do that 20 little percent to uh, to target each of those uh, various platforms. <clears throat> so, what's the conclusion? Um, and again, somebody else came up with this slide, and it depends. So. Uh, yeah, your situation is going to come down to um, what's best for you. Um, what's best for your organization uh, is the most important part because it's all about, like I said, making money, saving money. So which one of these options comes down to which one's going to give you the most coverage for the best value? So that's it. And uh, like I said, I'll be around the whole night and can answer about any other platforms you might have any uh, questions about, but uh, I'll open it up for anything right now if anybody has any questions that I can target. Do you have any cross solutions? Um, not in production yet. We're currently targeting a few and doing some demos for some people. Um, but like I said, there's just so much. Uh, momentum around it right now, and I'm personally working on something that uh, for probably for the, the next uh, Arena Tech Night to show off, but, um, and hopefully our app will be written using that. So, um, we did use uh, PhoneGap for the ODVS app, um, and uh, we used PhoneGap Build to package it up since they were gonna actually maintain it. Um, and that's where that, that browser inconsistency and then kind of the memory, memory issues, we didn't have control over uh, a lot of those things. So it was kind of frustrating in that. Um, whereas the, true, the, the code-based cross-compiled ones um, give you a lot more debugging tools. So that's better. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, Angular is good if you are a computer science major, um, which I was, and it, it solves some problems that maybe a lot of people don't have. Uh, so if you're really looking for very fine-tuned control over the HTML that you're rendering out, it's awesome. Um, to get a dev shop up to speed, it's like learning a whole new way of programming. So it's, like I said, it, it's good for the the egg headset, in my opinion. Whereas something like Backbone or um, uh, Ember is a little bit easier to digest for a team. So the, the architect can develop uh, forms and reusable code that the junior devs can understand because it follows the same paradigms that they're used to. Uh, Angular is awesome, but it's really high end. So. Anybody else? All right, well, like I said, I'll be around if anybody has any questions uh, after this, and then I think Vince has got some things to talk about. <laughs>